Hello. Mm -hmm. Right. Greetings, everyone. And thanks so much for taking the time to join us today for what's bound to be a very interesting virtual adventure through Mexico. As regular attendees, will have become accustomed to it's Nikki and Keith here from Rock Jumper. And besides the obvious fact that the featured country and presenter have changed, the only other difference from last week is that you don't get to hear from Nikki up front. She will have a be on a little later when it comes to Q&A at the end of Lev's presentation. On that note, for those of you attending for the first time, we really enjoy hearing from you. And we also love fielding your questions, so please feel free to ask away. We may not be able to answer all of your questions live, but we'll do our level best. To ask a question, say hi, or provide feedback, please use the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen, or else the chat function. So this week, Nikki and I are very excited to be joined by one of our most highly rated young guides, Lev Frid. Lev was born in St. Petersburg, Russia, but now resides in Huntsville, Canada. Lev has been in the natural, well, let's say he's been keen in the natural world since he was a, a young boy and has always had a serious fascination with all forms of wildlife. After finishing school, Lev spent close to a decade working in one of Canada's most famous parks, uh, that was Algonquin, educating thousands of visitors about various aspects of the park's ecology and contributing heavily to the area's records. His time at Algonquin was, however, mostly a warm season endeavor for Lev, and he spent his free months working at bird watching lodges throughout the Americas on a boat in North Carolina spotting seabirds and as a biologist conducting bird, plant, and ecosystem inventory all over Ontario. Essentially, anywhere where he'd be able to get outside with birds and people in his pursuit of birds and wildlife has taken him to many different countries. He's particularly fond of the American tropics where he spent many months leading tours and seeking birds on personal trips. Based on this brief summary, I believe you would all agree that Lev is a rather adventurous spirit. The next story, I believe, only adds another layer. So Lev's always had a major fascination for Mexico. The lure of exotic species like mot mot squans and honey creepers enthralled him so that when he was just 16 years old, I'll repeat that again, just 16 years old, sporting a brand spanking new driver's license, he took his brother's sedan and decided to drive it all the way down from Canada to Mexico to go and find some of the exotic birds he had always dreamed of. Sadly, his dream was cut short at the Mexican border post where failure to produce the car registration documents meant that he simply couldn't proceed any further. And those Mexican officials were having none of, uh, of what he had to say. But um, yeah, the adventure unfortunately ended in defeat for Lev, but only fueled the fire for a return and return he did, having now traveled extensively through the country on multiple occasions and finding a plethora of Mexican of Mexico's most desirable species. And on that note, I would like to hand over to Lev. All right, thanks very much, Keith and Nikki. Uh, that was lovely. Um, Mexico is a country that is very close to my heart um, for a variety of different reasons. Um, one of which um, is this, it's such a trove of birds that's very different from the birds that I was used to when I was younger. And um, I didn't really have any resources to be able to fly to Central America to go see all these exotic birds. Uh, but I had a car and I had a new driver's license and I went down there. Um, and one, one of the uh, birds that I was really keen on seeing uh, in Mexico uh, was this bird. This is the eared Quetzal. And uh, I really like sort of birds that are uh, juxtaposed with interesting uh, habitats and behaviors. Uh, this bird fills all those boxes. Uh, it's, uh, it's not related to the resplendent Quetzal that a lot of us are familiar with from further south. Um, but it's a uh, trogon, it's very large, and it lives in, uh, it lives in pine and mixed, uh, in mixed woods. So for me, I grew up in the boreal forest. Uh, I'm very familiar with this woodland. Um, but just the concept of trogons living there was uh, really, really fascinating to me. So that's, that was one of the main reasons I went down to Mexico. Um, I got in touch uh, with Karina, who's the young woman who took this photo. And uh, we became friends, actually we became really close friends and we've, uh, we've done a big trip to Brazil. And I tried to get down there. Uh, you know, this, this was a, an attempt, if you will, but unfortunately it was foiled. And not just the first time that, that Keith told you about, um, it has been foiled many times. This was one from 2014. 
uh, due to unforeseen circumstances, I wasn't able to make it down there. Um, but since then, uh, as Keith mentioned, I've been uh, to Mexico many times, uh, but never have I ever seen uh, the eared quetzal. So it's a, it's a nemesis bird, and it's really something that, uh, that really got the, the flame going for me uh, for Mexico uh, as a country to visit. Um, here's a map of Mexico. You will see it uh, on many occasions in this presentation. Okay, uh, there's 31 states plus the federal district there in the center where Mexico City is located. Here is a topographical map. Okay, so this is um, a little bit easier to picture what the topography uh, is like in Mexico. You'll notice uh, it is very mon montane, mountainous. Um, the Sierra Madre there you can see on the screen uh, is a a feature that's present throughout uh, the country. It's an extension of the North American Cordillera, which of course includes the Rocky Mountains. Um, you'll see the coastal areas on the, the Gulf Coast there. They're quite green on the map. Uh, this is lowland sort of uh, tropical type forest. And within, uh, there's a variety of valleys and uh, different zones of endemism that uh, exist. So I really like this picture. Uh, this picture is probably the furthest um, from anything that most people would think Mexico has to do with. Um, when you think of Mexico, for a lot of folks out here in Canada, for example, it's a, a tropical sunny destination with big beaches and things like that. Uh, this looks like an East Asian steppe in the middle of winter, but it's not. Uh, it is Llanos, which is a prairie complex in the north of the country. This is what it looks like with less snow. Okay, uh, not really a landscape that a lot of folks associate with Mexico, but an important uh, part of the country in the north. Uh, and as any good prairie complex in North America should, it does contain a lot of iconic animals such as bison. Okay, uh, it contains badgers, uh, black-footed ferrets, which is a species of high conservation concern, and a variety of birds. So this is a bird that a lot of folks probably don't associate with Mexico. Uh, it's Baird Sparrow. It's a tough to see bird. Uh, most folks who've seen this species probably would have done so in North Dakota, in the United States, or maybe in Canada, like me in Alberta or Saskatchewan. But in Mexico, uh, in Llanos especially, is where this species winters, okay? So not only is Mexico sort of this haven for endemisms and all sorts of uh, interesting resident birds, it's also a very, very important place for migrants from further north to spend the winter. And certainly, uh, Mr. Baird is one of them. Um, so there's uh, the map again, shows you Janos, which is in the north in Chihuahua, very close to the U.S. border. In the south of Mexico, it is vastly different than the north, okay? Uh, so this is a typical scene in maybe the Yucatan Peninsula, or this was in Chiapas State in the bottom. Uh, tropical, moist, humid forest, very hot down below. It does become cloud forest um, as you go further up in elevation, and it has uh, a bunch of birds that a lot of folks sort of associate with Central America. The mot mots are one, uh, are one example. This is toady mot mot, uh, the smallest of the mot mots, and one of the harder ones to see. Uh, it's got a very spotty range sort of throughout uh, Central America, uh, but Mexico is a good place to see it, and it certainly creeps into uh, to Mexico in a few different places. Keelbill toucans, another bird that um, usually isn't in the same sort of sentence or talk as Baird Sparrow, but here in Mexico, the two certainly live in the same country. Uh, this is a, a southern bird and uh, one that's fairly easy to see. It's widespread throughout Central America, but you can see it here in Mexico. You don't have to go that far. And the resplendent Quetzal. So this is uh, the Quetzal for, for most folks. Uh, this is a bird that many people have seen in Panama or Costa Rica, but you can certainly see it here in Mexico as well in the south in Chiapas and Guatemala. I will talk a little bit more about Quetzals later on, so that's something to look forward to, but it is, uh, it is here in Mexico. So to give you a little bit of an idea of distance, uh, it's a very large country. So the snowy steppe-like prairie of Llanos is approximately 2,300 kilometers or, 400 and, or 1,430 miles um, from El Triunfo, which is where that photo was taken of the cloud forest. Um, so that's a pretty far distance, yeah. So uh, Berlin, Germany to Madrid is a comparable distance, as well as San Francisco, which is in California, to Omaha, Nebraska. And within the middle, there are approximately 100 and, um, 
1,120 species. Again, this is often debated. Uh, certain records are accepted or not, and what have you. But it's an approximation, and it is a very, very rich avifauna. And 112 to 125, depending on who you list with, um, endemics. So it's a very, very high rate of endemism as well. Uh, in addition to the endemics, there are several near endemics um, on both ends. So in the north, um, there are species that are shared with just small portions of the United States, as well as in the south, there are species that are shared with Guatemala and Belize. So this is probably the most important question um, that I receive about Mexico, um, and um, for a good reason, is Mexico safe to visit, you know? Um, and the answer is a resounding yes. So a few things to consider when talking about the security of Mexico. There, there is violent crime that occurs. Uh, these areas where it occurs, it's very predictable. Uh, it's not directed towards tourists at all. And it occurs mostly in the north of Mexico. So these are places that on a rock jumper tour or on any given birding tour, um, we just don't visit them in Mexico at all. We avoid them completely and they're very easy to avoid. Um, the other thing to consider uh, about Mexico and uh, its safety is it's very close to the United States. And what that means is that it's often seen in the media. The United States obviously is a big media giant. So you see Mexico's name a lot in the media. Uh, mostly in a negative sort of way, just because of uh, political reasons. But um, it is the sixth most visited country by tourists in the world, uh, to the tune of 39 million per year. 39 million, that is a lot of folks coming to Mexico. A very small percentage of those are birders, for now. Um, but uh, it is a very, um, the places we visit are, are very safe and you don't have to worry. But just in case, uh, you want some reassurance? I've got some, uh, some stories from my various times going there. Uh, this was one of them. Um, there was a roadblock on a major highway in Chiapas. Uh, I think it was just an accident, like a truck may have flipped over. And um, a friend of mine and I were going to Tuxtla Gutierrez, which is, a, which is the capital of Chiapas. It's a big city. And I wanted to avoid driving at night, not so much for, for safety, as much as it was a Friday night, so people might have been driving a little bit crazy. Um, so I wanted to get there before, before it got dark. And uh, this roadblock lasted for several hours. And eventually, with the help of uh, many, many local people, uh, many of whom were elderly and some of whom didn't even speak Spanish, they spoke uh, Mayan dialects, uh, they babied uh, my friend and I through this quote-unquote road um, to, to our final destination and we made it. Uh, and it was very pleasant. It was a, a situation where... Um, something that was very kind of harrowing at the beginning uh, was made very, very easy and, uh, and pleasant by the locals. And one of my other favorite stories uh, about the, the time that I felt most uncomfortable in Mexico, it was on this same trip. And uh, my friend Kyle and I, we had this rented car and we went to a road that was quite famous for having some, uh, some troubles with locals and, and birders because birders were going on people's private property unknowingly sometimes uh, to bird. And so we know there were some, some altercations that occurred and, you know, I, we were ready, you know, I was gonna, we were looking for pink headed warbler, which is a fantastic little bird that I'll show you in just a few minutes. Um, so we were looking for this warbler, we were parked on the side of the road. I had this whole plan where, you know, if we have somebody that approaches us, we'd hide all of our optics and, um, we found the bird, we were looking at it with our optics and uh, taking lots of pictures of it. And suddenly there is this guy that was coming down the road uh, in a motorbike and he had this cooler that he was towing in his bike. And I thought, you know, what, you know, what could this possibly be? You know, and he saw us and was laying down on the horn and uh, sort of revving his engine. And I thought, oh no, you know, this is something bad is gonna happen because this is often how these stories start. And uh, so I tried to hide my equipment and so did Kyle and the guy came over and said, uh, oh, you know, what are you guys doing? And I was ready for an altercation. I said, oh, you know, we're just enjoying the birds. We came from, you know, all the way from Canada and yada, yada. And he said, well, if you're interested, um, I can sell you uh, an ice cream if you'd like. And uh, yeah, so that was the most uncomfortable I've ever felt in Mexico. And it was because somebody had tried to sell me an ice cream treat. Um, and that, that sort of speaks for itself in terms of security. This is a fun photo I like to share. Um, 
same day, we were driving back at night to Tuxla, which is, again is a big town in Chiapas. And there was this boa crossing the road, a Central American boa, boa imperator. I really love snakes, as some of you might know on social media. So I helped it across the road. We had a few folks that were um, interested in what we were doing and they pulled over to ask if we were okay uh, on this big road, only a few miles out of the big city of, uh, of Tuxla. So it was really nice. And uh, you know, I said, oh yeah, we're okay physically, uh, mentally, it's anyone's guess. So without further ado, we're gonna start our tour. And we're going to start it right there where the red circle is at the bottom of Baja, California. So this is a fantastic place. Uh, we do have a tour there. It's a very short tour. It's only five days. Excuse me. But this is enough to see a lot of the regions or all almost of the regions endemics. It's a fascinating place. Um, Cabo San Lucas, which is the town that we stay at at the bottom there. Beautiful, beautiful town. Uh, really blends into the fantastic scenery there. A lot of uh, a lot of plant diversity. If you really like plants on the Baja Peninsula, cacti. Uh, this is the carbon. It's a very large cactus. It's the biggest cactus in the world. One of 150 or so species that exist on the peninsula. 70% of which are endemic, found nowhere else in the world. So, fantastic little spot. Um, if you're a if you've never been to North America before, or if you're listing from Mexico. Uh, several birds are only found here in Mexico that are usually found um, further north in the United States. This is one of them, the wren tit. Okay, it's a, a fascinating little bird, affiliations with the parrot bills, I believe now, and it's the only representative uh, in North America, and you can see them here. But most birding tours come, of course, for the endemics. This is one of them, Belding's yellow throat. Uh, Mexico has a variety of endemic yellow throats. Okay, they're all Pretty fancy looking, this, uh, this is the one that you see in Baja. Zantu's hummingbird, this is a young male, another endemic of the Baja Peninsula. And very exciting, gray thrasher, uh, yet another endemic. Okay, so there's a few birds uh, found here that are found nowhere else. And also, there's a great potential for splits. There's a variety of species. Uh, there's an acorn woodpecker with a dark eye and a slightly different social system, uh, and a variety of other things. That, um, that you only see really uh, down here. So worth it. And uh, seabirds, it's quite good for seabirds if you can get out in a boat, uh, especially murrelets. Uh, you can see all three there, uh, Craveris, which is this one, um, Scripses, which is very similar, and Guadalupe murrelet, which you can see down there as well. So that was a short little trip. Um, you can infinitely explore Baja, it's amazing. It's got a lot of uh, reptiles and amphibians that are endemic too. Um, but we're going to make our way towards the center of the country to these states here, Jalisco, uh, Colima, Michoacan, and what have you. This is somewhere where we stay when we're down there. There's a couple of tours that we offer um, down there. There's an extension that you can combine with uh, other Mexico tours, or there is a Birding Amongst Volcanoes tour, which takes place here. Uh, Manzanillo, beautiful modern city, um, fantastic beach, a little bit chilly sometimes, but uh, the mountains in the background provide an excellent backdrop. In general, uh, cities in Mexico tend to be um, very, very easily sort of navigable. They have all the creature comforts that you, uh, except maybe Mexico City, it's not very navigable there, um, but they have all the creature comforts. You know, you can go, you can have a fantastic local Mexican dish at a little tiny restaurant in a downtown complex, and in a couple hours, you can go to McDonald's for, for dinner. Um, you know, it's a great blend of historic and modern stuff. Getting around is very easy. Even if something like your camera breaks down or you need a new memory card, you can very easily get that at Walmart or like a gas station. It's, it's fantastic. Yeah, it's really easily uh, traversable in most areas. Back to the birds. This is a, a fantastic little endemic. This is Blue Mockingbird. Every once in a while, it shows up in the States, but here it's quite common throughout Mexico, not only in Manzanillo, but uh, good a place as any to, to try and find one out here. Jays, a lot of beautiful jays occur in Mexico. This is one of them, the black-throated magpie jay. Uh, really long tail, very loud and in charge, very easy to see uh, in many places in central Mexico, okay? 
Citrioline trogan, a Western Mexican endemic. Uh, fantastic little trogan that we see. We also see it in Oaxaca, okay, on the coast. And also the red-breasted chat, okay? So a fantastic, uh, beautiful little bird, West Mexican endemic. There's another granitellus that lives on the uh, Yucatan Peninsula, the gray-throated chat, which we also look for. And it is, it can be a bit of a skulker, but uh, often we get very nice views such as this. And this is the, very narrowly, the smallest owl in the world, okay? It is the Kalima pygmy owl. It's just a few millimeters smaller than the elf owl. So if you're familiar with those from further north, um, it's comparable, but it is active during the day. So it's much easier to get uh, beautiful looks such as this, at this uh, little pygmy owl. And in the higher elevations, uh, when you encounter pine forests and things like that, uh, you'll see sometimes flocks of these gray silkies. Uh, they're pretty eruptive. They move back and forth based on food. A lot of the time you see them flying, uh, but sometimes you see them perched, uh, such as this one. And they are a beautiful little bird, uh, similar to a waxwing or a phanopepla, which they're related to from North America. Bat falcons. Um, Fascinating bird, uh, very widespread throughout the Americas, but uh, again, this is where they sort of start in earnest and then they go further further down. Uh, Lesser Roadrunner, that cute little ground cuckoo, uh, just a, a fascinating little bird. Quite a bit smaller than Greater Roadrunner, if you're used to that, um, from further north. Uh, but it's endemic to Mexico and northern Central America. And as you can see, they do live up to their name. Uh, lineated woodpecker, another common sort of widespread bird that uh, you often see in other places, um, but it's quite common in Mexico and it's sort of where it starts, so you don't need to go far from the U.S. or Canada to see it. And this is pretty cool. Um, this is the masked northern bobwhite. So masked bobwhites uh, historically were present in the United States, uh, in Texas and Arizona, but unfortunately they are largely extirpated. Uh, but you can see this morph in Mexico where it's not uncommon. And it really is a strange looking, a strange looking bird there. As you go sort of towards the center of the country, um, closer towards Mexico City, the forest sort of starts to look like this. Uh, this is a temperate mixed forest, very similar to a lot of forests you find uh, further north in the United States and Canada. And the birds are quite similar as well, uh, but they do have a distinctive Mexican flair. So this is one of them, Strickland's woodpecker, uh, similar to a down here, a hairy woodpecker or a ladderback that you might find further north, uh, but it is endemic to a small area of central Mexico. And uh, another one of those fancy yellow throats, uh, black polled yellow throat. This is my favorite. Uh, it's, uh, it is a fantastic looking bird. It's got a big hood and kind of a little olive on the hind crown there. Very limited in its range in just a few central Mexican marshes. Uh, it's one that we certainly seek out. And uh, the closest thing that uh, Mexico has to an endemic bird family. This is the Ocotero, uh, popularly known as the olive warbler. Uh, not a very good name for it. It's not olive colored, nor is it a warbler. It's, it's in its own family. Um, you can find it in Mexico. You can find it in certain places in the United States and um, in northern Central America. But it is a cool little bird, and it often uh, follows mixed flocks around in central Mexico. So always fun encountering them. Another central Mexican endemic, the Aztec rail, a recent split from king rail. Okay, so these large rails have been split a few times now in the past uh, several years. Uh, there may be more coming, so always, uh, always a good idea to see these big rails in Mexico, because you never know. Clapper rail has been split into Clapper and Ridgeways, and there's forms of the Ridgeways that might be split uh, even further. So something to watch for. I know it's a talk about birds. Uh, it's, difficult, uh, it's difficult talking about Mexico just because it's so big, um, but there are a few natural history events that occur in this part of Mexico in Michoacan uh, that I think are worth mentioning. Uh, one of them is this, the monarch migration. So the monarch is a large butterfly that uh, spends the winter in central Mexico and Michoacan in a few reserves and it migrates north through several generations before the last generation which is the furthest north here in Canada will migrate down to Michoacan to spend the winter and you could see hundreds of thousands of them. A lesser known event that happens uh, in the same state in Michoacan is the migration or arabada of the olive ridley. 
So the olive ridley is a sea turtle. It's a very small species, but this, the ridleys uh, are characterized by having these mass nesting events. And in Michoacan, you could see thousands and thousands coming onto shore. September to December uh, is the best time, um, usually on a new moon. Uh, it's fantastic. It's, uh, it's definitely something to see um, and uh, a good reason to, to visit Michoacan during that time. So working our way further south to these two states, Veracruz and Oaxaca, this is our most popular Mexico trip uh, to Oaxaca. So we sell a lot of these um, for good reason. They're, they're fantastic little trips. Uh, and Veracruz we, um, we include as a, an addition, okay? So you can add uh, Veracruz onto your Oaxaca trip, which a lot of people end up doing. And it's a good idea because uh, our center when we stay there is Jalapa, which is here. And it's a beautiful little town. Um, and Pico de Orizaba, which you see in the background there, is the highest peak uh, in Mexico at 5,600 or so meters, and the third highest peak in all of North America, okay, after Denali and Logan, which is in the US and Canada, respectively. So that's the beautiful scene you see out there. Not too many birds up there, except maybe the occasional wandering siskin or crossbill or yellow eyed junco. But the town of Jalapa, it's very nice because there's a lot of different forests and uh, places you can visit very, very close to town. Um, a lot of Mexican endemics spread out uh, in this area, such as this one. Bumblebee hummingbird is, um, it's widespread throughout Mexico, uh, but this is a really good place to see it. It's a very small hummingbird, not to be confused with the bee hummingbird of Cuba, uh, which is even smaller, but uh, this one is quite small and easily seen in many places. Uh, but really the gem of, uh, one of the gems of Veracruz is this Tuxtla quail dove. And it's only found in one small mountainous area, the Sierra de los Tuxtlas. And we look for it there. It's kind of a tricky bird to, to see as most quail doves tend to be, uh, but we do have pretty good luck with it. So, and this bird uh, and its sister species are uh, endemic to Mexico and they're just fantastic little birds. This is Sumacrast wren, okay. And it, just by looking at the picture, you can see it's not very similar to any other wren that exists. It's this long build, uh, short tailed wren that uh, is very stumpy. And uh, this bird, a Nava's wren, which is another species that looks very similar and is also a micro endemic. Uh, they live in these limestone outcrops and uh, it's a limestone loving wren and it hops in and out of these big uh, areas of stone uh, going into the little tunnels in the stone. Uh, it can be a hard bird to get a very good look at, but every once in a while they do sort of hop up and, and give you a nice opportunity. And uh, yeah, just there's nothing, no wren that exists in the world that's like these two. And certainly a highlight of uh, a visit to Veracruz is Sumacrast's wren. Uh, other woodpeckers, such as bronze-winged woodpecker, uh, this is an endemic. Some authorities consider it conspecific with golden olive, but that's pretty far away in terms of range, so it's probably a, a distinct species and one we look for when we're down there. Eventually we, from Veracruz, make our way to Oaxaca, and Oaxaca is uh, a fantastic place. Uh, I love Oaxaca very much. Uh, it's beautiful. This is a, a view from one of the hotels that I stayed at when I was down there. So just a fantastic, fantastic place. It's a place where you can get, um, you know, the greatest Mexican cuisine, um, across from a McDonald's, you know, you can, not that I'm, you shouldn't go to McDonald's when you're there because that would be a cardinal sin, but um, just the accessibility and the mixture of uh, modern culture and um, sort of antique Mexican culture, it's a great blend uh, in Oaxaca. And if you're a history buff, okay, Oaxaca is an excellent place. Um, the Zapotecs, this is the most important Zapotec site in the world, Monte Alban. Uh, 500 BC is uh, approximately the time when this was occupied and it is uh, it's a great place for birding <laughs> you know if, uh, there's a lot of interesting endemics that could be located right on the grounds of Monte Alban uh, but just seeing the the architecture uh, is fantastic and if you're in Oaxaca City proper uh, I know a lot of folks like to sort of come in and do a couple of days before uh, a tour Oaxaca is the place to do that um, this is uh, the Museum of Culture. This was um, an artifact that was actually excavated from Monte Alban, from Temple 7, I think, which is 
um, somewhere where we under, you know, we obtained a lot of our current understanding of the Zapotex. It's a human skull that's uh, engraved with, uh, with jade. It's encrusted with jade. Uh, pretty, pretty cool stuff. Uh, this is uh, in a museum there, uh, the Cultural Museum in Oaxaca. So awesome. We can't, you know, I could talk all day about the Zapotecs and the Mayans and the Aztecs. And it's, uh, it's really uh, an exceptional part of Mexico that everybody should explore. Uh, but trying to get back into the birds here, uh, Oaxaca has quite a few endemics. Uh, this is pretty heavy on the endemics, uh, the trips that we do here. This is one of them, Bucard's wren, similar to a cactus wren in both behavior and appearance. And gray-breasted woodpecker. This is a Malamirpes, like uh, some of the more familiar woodpeckers further north. Um, but it's endemic and it's a fantastic little bird, pretty easy to see. And bridled sparrow. This genus uh, Pusea is quite uh, abundant in Mexico. There are several endemic species and uh, they are all very large and very striking sparrows. Bridled sparrow certainly fits that bill. Um, and they're quite easy to see, quite responsive to, uh, to fishing. Slaty Vireo, uh, another Mexican endemic that occurs in the area of Oaxaca. Just a fantastically colored species. Uh, that white pale eye is just uh, astounding uh, to see when you see it poking out of a, a dense thicket. Uh, it is a skulker, but uh, with time we can get, usually get pretty good views of them. And another Vireo, um, a much larger one. This is the chestnut-sided Shrike Vireo. Okay, and as all Shrike Vireos are, it can be a little bit difficult uh, to see because it often spends time uh, in the canopy. But luckily, if you have your trusty rock jumper guide with you with their Zeiss scope, um, we'll be able to get a good look at this, uh, this canopy dwelling vireo. And this photo I actually took through uh, my Zeiss Gavia scope with, uh, with my phone. So it's quite a nice photo for a phone and uh, you can certainly see uh, this beautiful vireo uh, in all its splendor. This is probably one of Mexico's greatest birds. Uh, you'll probably hear me say that a lot through the talk, but uh, the red warbler, descriptive, uh, fairly common, very loud, especially um, in the breeding season, easy to detect in the mixed flocks. Yeah, so easy to see, uh, just a spectacular bird. And uh, gray barred wrens, uh, these are another endemic wren to Mexico, and we often make it a point to try and locate flocks of them not only to see them themselves, because they are an endemic, as I mentioned, but also to look for this uh, endemic jay, the dwarf jay. So dwarf jays, uh, quite rare, uh, but often, almost always actually, with these noisy flocks of gray barred wrens. So we know where to look, we have very good luck with these, uh, but they are, uh, they can be one of the tougher birds uh, on a Mexico trip. Oaxaca has a few endemics that bear its name. Uh, this is one of them, the Oaxaca sparrow. Okay, quite a, a striking little sparrow in the deciduous forests of Oaxaca. And the Oaxaca hummingbird, also known as the blue cap hummingbird. Uh, a spectacular hummingbird that only lives in a very small area um, in Oaxaca. It's endemic to the state. Buntings. Uh, Mexico is not without several fantastic buntings. This is one of them, orange-breasted bunting. Um, very well named if you see an adult male uh, with an orangish tinge to the breast and throat. Um, but really the blue is what stands out uh, on these buntings a lot to me especially. Uh, just a fantastic bird. And uh, this is another photo from a different angle. I know a lot of uh, photographers uh, come on our tours with Rock Jumper and Mexico is an excellent place for bird photography. Um, the habitat isn't particularly dense in most places so most of the species, including a lot of the endemics, are pretty easy to photograph. And uh, just sort of an example, uh, most of the times that when I was visiting Mexico, I didn't really have a great camera. I didn't really take any pictures. So all of the pictures that you see in this presentation um, that have my name underneath them are pictures that I took on one single trip that was only about 10 days long, okay? So quite a few nice pictures, at least I, I think so. And uh, somebody actually who knew what they were doing were to go on this trip, you'd be able to get fantastic pictures of all these amazing birds. Uh, this, talking about pictures, you know, this is a, a great picture, I think, of, uh, of this bird. This is the lesser brown cuckoo. Uh, not endemic to Mexico, but uh, pretty easily seen in many parts of the country. It's not, uh, it's not like one of those legendary neomorphous. Um, it is quite, quite common in some areas, but still very cool to see. And that I love the, uh, 
the black eyeliner with the with the blue uh, behind the the eye there. It's uh, quite nice. Uh, part of Oaxaca that it shares with Chiapas is this little narrows there that I've pointed out on the map. That's the Isthmus of Tehuantepec, okay? It's an area of endemism, and it's also the place where the Gulf of Mexico um, gets as close as it ever gets to the Pacific Ocean in, uh, in Mexico, okay? So we visit this area uh, for two key endemics, and one of them, uh, which is this, the rose-bellied or the Rosita's bunting, must be one of the best birds in the world, at least to me. Um, it is an unbelievable uh, color. I mean, just the blue, and uh, it slowly sort of fades into that pink. Here's a different photo of it. It looks like a South Pacific sunset. I mean, this is a fantastic bird. It's easy to find. Uh, you know, we have no trouble locating it, and um, they are just Amazing, amazing buntings. Uh, quite a bit bigger than indigo bunting that you might be familiar with in North America. Um, but another jewel in, uh, in Oaxaca and Chiapas's crown. The other endemic, cinnamon-tailed sparrow, uh, is less showy, but still very special and belongs to that genus Pusea where there's quite a few endemics in Mexico. So we've made it to Chiapas, um, a very famous part of Mexico. Uh, now a lot of birding uh, tours and a lot of folks go there for birding and for good reason. Okay, if you like the uh, the Mayans, there's a lot of Mayan ruins in Chiapas, a lot of very famous ones. Um, we do go birding in some of them every once in a while. Um, and Chiapas is kind of a unique place in Mexico because I showed you that little uh, the isthmus of Tehuantepec. So that's a barrier for a lot of birds. Okay. The Sierra Madre becomes very flat out there. It becomes very desert-like. Uh, desert and not many birds from Central America could make it across to colonize uh, North America. Okay, so on the other side of the Isthmus, on the Chiapas side, you see quite a few birds that you would not have seen in Oaxaca. Okay, and a lot more birds that are typical of Central America than North America. This is one of them, Azure Hooded Jay, a beautiful jay. Um, many different jays. <laughs> down there. They're not quite as easy to see as North American jays. Uh, they can be, they're loud, but they can be a little sparse, uh, but we do often have very good luck with them. This is the other one or another one, a uh, unicolored jay, well named. Um, it's endemic to Mexico and Northern Central America, and it's, it's due for a split. Uh, it might be split uh, a few different ways, okay? So it's one to look at anyway, and we're back to the Quetzal. So I mentioned uh, the Quetzal earlier in the talk about how, you know, a lot of people see it in Panama and Costa Rica, and they're both great places to see it. I highly recommend going to see it there. But the birds that live in northern Central America are a different subspecies, okay? And actually, this was a proposed split a couple of years ago. Uh, it didn't go through. But there are morphological differences between uh, the southern and the northern ones. And the most important is the tail. Um, so I, I used to live in Costa Rica, so I saw Quetzals, you know, on a regular basis. But when I saw these northern ones, it really is striking, the difference uh, of the tail. The tail is quite a bit longer uh, in these adult males in these northern populations. Uh, so it really is worth seeing uh, in Chiapas or Guatemala. And if that wasn't legendary enough for you, the real sort of uh, crowning jewel of Chiapas is this bird, the horned guan, um, an another bird that is shared with Guatemala. And a lot of people uh, go to either of those two countries to see. This is a bird that uh, requires a bit of effort to see. Um, usually on most Mexico tours, it's very low, uh, low amount of walking, no climbing, uh, pretty easy. But horned guans live in pretty, pretty harsh landscapes. So you do have to walk a little bit um, or a lot in some cases to, uh, to see one. But um, in both Chiapas and in Guatemala, there are new sites that have been discovered where you can see the horned guan. It doesn't require multiple days of trekking like it used to. Um, it's still pretty tough walking, but it's not quite as long as the previous location. So a good place to try and see it. Oh, yes. And I'll let this image sit here for a while because this hummingbird to me looks like it belongs in a hummingbird garden in Colombia or, or a birding lodge in Ecuador. It's spectacularly beautiful. It's the garnet-throated hummingbird. And if, I mean, it is just unbelievable. The wings are orange, uh, and you can see this while the bird is flying. It's one of the best 
giveaways when you see one in the dark forest interior. But if you have one uh, perched out in the open, you really can appreciate their throat. You know, the crown is like this green with a little bit of blue. It's got this purple collar. Um, just a fantastic bird, a fantastic bird. And it's endemic to Mexico and Northern Central America, which is a common theme, of course, in Chiapas. This is another one, um, the wine-throated hummingbird. Quite, quite a nice uh, whimsical name uh, for the color of its gorget. It's a gorgeous wraparound gorget that the males flare when they're displaying. And such a display you could see fairly easily in Oaxaca, or sorry, in Chiapas uh, or Northern Central America. And this, you know, it just keeps going. You know, I, uh, when I talk about Chiapas, you know, I talk about, a, a, you know, an exciting bird that you could see there and you think like, oh yeah, like that's the pinnacle. But, but no, it's the gift that keeps on giving uh, Chiapas. Pink-headed warbler, probably one of the world's best warblers. It is a fantastic bird. The combination of colors on it is just unreal. This, this sort of hoar-frosted pink face uh, is... is uh, it, it's much nicer in life, obviously, than, uh, than in a picture, but even then, it's, uh, it's a fantastic bird, definitely worth going there. It's endemic to Chiapas, excuse me, and Northern Central America as well. Here is another warbler. This one is not quite as range-restricted as the previous one, but it's still, and actually, actually often found together with pink-headed. This is golden brad, okay? Beautiful bird. If you like owls, there's a few owls to look for down there. Fulvus owl is one of them. It's endemic to Chiapas in Northern Central America. And if you like scenery, there's a lot of that in Chiapas too. This is the Sumadero Canyon, which is located just 20 minutes uh, outside of Tuxtla Gutierrez, which is the biggest city in Chiapas, the capital. And um, fantastic scenery, just, uh, just gorgeous and fantastic birding too. Um, belted flycatcher, which is a species that's often looked for in Guatemala. It shares it with Chiapas, and here you could see it fairly easily. It's a beautiful, beautiful little bird. And actually blue seed eater, which is kind of an enigmatic species that's present uh, throughout Central America. Um, I have had quite a bit of luck in the recent years uh, in Chiapas for blue seed eaters. Coastal Chiapas also has a variety of specialty birds. Um, this is probably the top of the list for most people, the giant wren. Um, it is a true giant. It is massive. Um, it's actually the same size as the bicolored wren that you might have seen in, in Colombia, but it's, uh, it is a treat to see these birds in a big family group uh, making all kinds of their bubbly vocalizations. Um, it's, uh, and it's endemic to Chiapas. There's one little area in Guatemala where it was recently discovered, uh, but it is, it is endemic to a coastal area of, uh, of Chiapas. As uh, coastal areas are, they, they come with a variety of, uh, of different water birds that you can see. This is russet naped wood rail, pretty widespread throughout, uh, throughout North and South America, but uh, not uh, a common bird, a common bird that you see in Central America anyway, and uh, pretty abundant in Chiapas. But one thing that surprises a lot of people, uh, including me when I first discovered about it, is the agami heron. So this is a bird that... Um, is pretty widespread. You know, you could see it in South America, you can see it in Central America, uh, but in most places where you try and see it, it's quite rare. Um, in most trips to Costa Rica, which is a popular place to go look for it, uh, you do not see it. But there is a place where you can actually canoe, um, or you're, you're being canoed, you're not forced to actually operate the canoe, um, into a breeding colony of these agami herons in, uh, in Chiapas. So you don't even have to go to Central America, you can see them right there on your doorstep in Mexico. Um, which is pretty cool uh, for me. You know, this is one of the things that uh, I was really excited about. Um, and that's in coastal Chiapas in the south. And boat-billed heron, uh, of course, another bizarre looking heron. Um, it's one that's found there, it's widespread, but uh, you can certainly see it in Chiapas. And even sun grebe, a uh, popular bird on, uh, on many tours. Uh, really funky feet. If you ever get to see the feet, uh, highly recommended that you, <laughs> that you have a look because they do, they're not like any other feet that I'm aware of in the bird world. They're uh, yellow with, uh, with black stripes. So that's very cool. And last but not least, um, we have arrived in the Yucatan Peninsula, which is a whole other set of endemisms and a lot of different ecosystems and whatnot. So again, an excellent place uh, for fans of uh, Mayan architecture, a lot of really famous uh, Chichen Itza, for example, 
and um, Tikal in Guatemala are uh, are sites of uh, Mayan interest there in uh, in the Yucatan. Uh, Coba is one of the places we go to uh, to look for birds, and it's a very birdy little zone. Yucatan J, uh, classic Yucatan Peninsula bird, uh, very big, um, large and in charge, as I like to say, uh, very loud, and it sort of looks like a lot of other species of jays in Mexico. But sometimes, if you find a group, you'll often uh, see them accompanied, at least during the fledging season, with their young, which are white. Ah, this is a really bizarre. And uh, when you see it and you don't expect it, you really kind of um, shakes you a little bit to see this completely white bird following these Yucatan jays. Looks like it might be leucistic or, uh, or albino, but uh, it's not. It's, uh, it's the juvenile, the juvenile plumage of Yucatan jay. And this is another um, Yucatan endemic. Uh, it's a paranga, like the summer tanager. Uh, it's the rose-throated tanager. Uh, just a, a, and it's another one of these birds that has a very unique color scheme. It's, it's almost white, um, and it has uh, red wings and a red crest, big honking bill. Uh, cool, another sort of cool bird that you see in the Yucatan. And this one is one of my favorite Yucatan birds, a uh, black catbird. It does look a lot like a, a gray catbird from uh, North America, or nor further north in North America, uh, but it's not closely related. It's in a different genus. Um, but a bird that's common, especially in mangrove areas uh, in, uh, in Mexico, in the Yucatan Peninsula. And this bird, a uh, beautiful little hummingbird, the Mexican sheer tail. Uh, it has a tiny little population in Veracruz, but uh, most of the world's Mexican sheer tails are in the Yucatan Peninsula. And probably the Yucatan's most famous bird, and certainly probably the one that most people want to see, excuse me, when they go, oscillated turkey. Um, it is the only other species of wild turkey besides wild turkey, of course, and it is, it's almost unreal. The, the, um, the colors that you see on this animal are just unbelievable. They're every color of the rainbow um, you can see on these, uh, these magnificent turkeys. Uh, the head is just bonkers. You know, it's blue with these orange pustules on it. Uh, just a fantastic bird um, and one that's endemic to the Yucatan, and uh, we do see it here. Uh, pretty much every time, or every time, yeah. And the bird that uh, in many pre-Columbian uh, cultures was, uh, was revered, uh, and you can see why, uh, the king vulture, okay? It's quite common uh, in more forested areas in the Yucatan, and uh, it is a spectacular bird. You can see it all over um, sort of Central and South America to an extent, but uh, you can definitely see them here, and they are uh, always a highlight. There's one bird that you can't really talk about the Yucatan um, without mentioning, and it's this one, the turquoise browed motmot. And um, like most motmots, it sort of has, uh, it has that long tail uh, with the two medallions at the end of it. Uh, that's a, a thing that the bird does itself as soon as it molts those tails and it actually plucks uh, its tail to make those medallions. But the interesting thing about this species um, is that it's the only one to nest colonially sometimes. Uh, it ranges all the way down into Costa Rica, but uh, in the Yucatan, you can find colonies of 60 or 100 birds together. Uh, usually they nest in these cenotes, which are wells. Um, a lot have religious significance. And uh, they also nest, uh, remarkably, in ventilation shafts and uh, uh, along in the, in the pyramids there. So in the New World, um, the turquoise broad motmot is probably one of the first birds that became commensal with humans, um, with the Mayans. Yeah, so it nests in their buildings and uh, there's a lot of deforestation that would have gone on to, uh, to open up the plazas and to start building. This is a bird of secondary growth. Uh, so it does not thrive in, in deep forest. It needs open areas to survive. Certainly lots of those were provided um, by folks who were living there. So yeah, a very interesting piece of natural history. And a beautiful bird. I mean, just one of the most spectacular motmots, as you can see. And every once in a while, there is a, a surprise that happens. So pheasant cuckoo, it's widespread uh, throughout Central and South America, but it's nowhere common. And I've had luck a few times in various places in Mexico, the Yucatan being one, uh, of seeing these secretive birds. So in addition to all of these endemics and uh, you know, all these amazing birds that you see, there's always room for surprises when it comes to Mexico.
Uh, when we go to the Yucatan, we go to the island of Cozumel, which has a few endemics. This is one of them, the Cozumel vireo. And uh, there's an emerald and there's also a thrasher, which is almost, well, I shouldn't say that. It's probably extinct. Um, but another feature of the Yucatan that a lot of folks really love are the American flamingos. They're very common and uh, they offer such beautiful views uh, as this one here. So um, we are basically at the end of the presentation. And uh, just before we go, I'd like to show you this picture as sort of to whack your appetite a little bit more about Mexico. So this is a tufted to jay, uh, definitely one of the world's greatest jays. I mean, it's big, it's amazingly colored, it's got a big, beautiful crest, um, and it's a central North Mexican endemic. You can find it in Durango. And um, it's really one of these things that I like to, to throw out there to say, hey, there's a lot more than just this talk uh, to be discovered about Mexico. There's a lot of amazing birds to see out there. And I hope uh, it sort of gave you a little spark to, to start your own journey into hopefully visiting Mexico and uh, seeing some of its amazing birds. So thank you very much. Um, so thank you especially to uh, these folks who donated their photos to be used uh, in the presentation, okay, especially Eric donated a lot of, uh, of great photos that I used. And the last two pictures there are that lesser ground cuckoo looking fabulous. And uh, on the left there, there's a, a Mexican endemic. It's called the Happy Wren. Um, so I hope you're happy with the presentation and uh, thank you very much for, for listening. Oh, thank you so much, Lev. And, and so, so many beautiful comments coming through. Um, Mur Murray saying, love the energy, great presentation, Peggy says, Fantastic presentation. Oh, thank you Ed very much. Says, Thanks for the super awesome. presentations all coming through. Really appreciate it, guys. Thank you so much. We feed off the awesome. energy and we really love spending this time with all of you. And um, yeah, I've got a couple of questions that have come through and I'm, I'm glad we've right. some time to, to go through it. The first one here is, do you see the monarch butterflies during the tour? That's a very good question. Um, we do not at this time. Um, the monarchs are there sort of December through until March. Uh, January, February is kind of the best time to see them. Uh, that's when most of them are, are there. And they're... In March, they tend to get a little bit restless. Some of them start to move. Uh, so January, February is a good time to see them. Uh, at present, we do not visit any monarch reserves um, when we visit uh, that state. But um, that's very easily done as an add-on. Um, or as part of a tailor-made tour. Uh, and you can, you know, if you're doing tailor-made, you can string all of these places together and see a bunch of natural events, including the monarchs and the turtles, uh, in addition to your birding. So. Absolutely, absolutely. And, um, um, you know, Katie also asked um, a question, uh, what uh, bird guide for Mexico do you recommend? That is a very good question. So the current guide... Uh, for Mexico, as uh, the Steve Howell and Sophie Webb, it's very old, uh, it's very large, and unfortunately it's outdated. Um, but it's the only one that really contains um, all of the species, excluding some splits um, that you'll find in Mexico. There's a couple of other guides that are worth mentioning. Uh, there's a Peterson, again, it's another one of these old guides that has a keelbilled toucan on the cover. Um, there's a Peterson guide, and that one includes uh, species that you'll find in Mexico, but it doesn't include the migrants. So you'll have to buy another guide or take another guide with you um, for the North American migrants. And if you are going to Chiapas, um, there are a couple of guides that cover that area. The Northern Central American guides, uh, there's a Peterson guide, a, a fantastic little small one, and there's a big guide for Central America that also will do you well, in Chiapas, it might not include some of the endemics, but those are easily enough to, to pick out. Oh, thanks. And, and thanks right in the beginning mentioning the safety. That was actually going to be one of my questions. Um, yes, that's and, very important. And, and a couple of people also came through, you know, Harry just came through now as well, said thank you for mentioning the safety because that always plays on your mind when you're traveling. And, you know, as Definitely. a female as well, yeah. I, I want to know that I'm safe when I'm traveling. So thank you so yes. much. Yes, yeah. Um, and... Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's very safe. And, uh, you know, the places we go are places where you know, it's virtually unheard of, this large, um, you know, the crime that you hear about. Um, it's very easy to avoid. It's not anything to worry about uh, at all. How long is the trip? Uh, does it encompass all of Mexico? And, and what type of transportation is used? 
That is a very good question. Uh, so we offer a variety of, uh, of trips to Mexico. Some of them are as short as five days. That's just a little week-long vacation that we offer in Baja. But most, um, excuse me, most trips are sort of in the 10 to 15 day uh, range. Um, they don't visit all of Mexico. Mexico is a massive, massive country. So you, you can do it in one trip, um, but you, it would take a very long time. It would take some, some, uh, some clipping and cutting and pasting. Um, but the classic Mexico trip is uh, 10 to 15 days um, in Oaxaca, Chiapas. You can add a Veracruz extension. And of course, uh, another plug for TaylorMade. Um, you can build your own trip uh, with TaylorMade. You can combine all those, uh, all those places, including some places that we don't go to on regular tours. Um, and in terms of transportation, it's, uh, it's really easy to get around in most places. We use just a coaster. Uh, we don't really have a need for four by four vehicles in, in most places uh, as, as it stands right now. So it's typical coaster transportation. And like I mentioned earlier, uh, it's very comfortable. Uh, the roads are all paved and well-maintained, fast moving. We don't have very long drives uh, really on any of these trips. The longest drive might be, you know, three or four hours and that's just one day. So it's very comfy. Great. Um, let me go through the list here. Uh, 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 Worthens, I hope I'm pronouncing it correctly, uh, Worthen Sparrow, do you visit that air, area to get? Uh, no, um, that's a very good question. Um, I love Worthen Sparrows. Uh, they're in Monterey, which is in uh, the northeast portion of Mexico. Uh, we do not at this point uh, visit uh, Monterey area as a tour. Uh, it's quite similar, the avifauna, to a lot of places in North America. There's a couple of endemic, in nor northern North America, I should say. There's a couple of endemics, Worthens is one of them, and um, there's a maroon-fronted parrot, which is similar to thick-billed parrot, uh, the two endemics that you go for there. Um, it's a cool spot to visit, um, but it's not somewhere that we go on tour, uh, at least for now. And yet, uh, Quet Quet uh, Quetzal, um, would that also be in places that is safe to travel to see those? Yeah, so eared Quetzals, uh, they do exist in places that uh, are safe to travel to. Uh, we currently don't offer any itineraries, um, any scheduled itineraries that uh, visit somewhere where you can see eared Quetzals. There's, um, when I was talking about the Tufted Jay, uh, that's about as far south as they go reliably in the sort of Durango Highway area, and you can see them there. Um, that's a potential tour for the future, perhaps, yeah. or uh, a tailor-made tour, but um, they don't exist in Oaxaca or Chiapas. Um, um, I love Jillian's yeah. comment here. Uh, thanks. Uh, who would not want to go to Mexico with Liv, Liv um, after that upbeat presentation? Better trip with him would that be so much I like fun. That is why I here. <laughs> we were Thank just you thinking very much. The same I'm glad thing. you enjoyed it. And uh, it's true. I really, I really love Mexico. And I, uh, I always highly recommend uh, folks to go. Whether it be with me or with any one of our awesome leaders, it's, uh, it's a great place to visit. Um, and yeah, just to answer Julia's question, I'm sorry you missed the, the, the part on safety, but we are recording this webinar and we will email out to all registrants uh, a copy within the next 24 to 48 hours, you'll see, and be able to play that over again. So that's no worries. Um, is there a pelagic boat time um, on, on any of the tours? Yes, there are. Uh, so actually on the Oaxaca trip, uh, I didn't mention it in the, in the talk just because of, of time constraints, but there is a, uh, a pelagic that we do on the Oaxaca trips that leaves uh, from close to Huatulco, which is uh, a place that we stay at there. Um, it's a short trip. It's not one of those taxing like 11 hour pelagics or anything like that, um, but it does net some, some interesting birds. Probably the best bird quote unquote best, the most sought after bird is the Townsend Shearwater. Um, but it's, it's quite rare, you know, we don't see it every time. Uh, but we do see lots of wedge-tailed shearwaters. Uh, we see lots of Galapagos shearwaters uh, when they're around. Uh, black storm petrel, ashy storm petrel, least storm petrel, um, quite a few highlights. Yeah, the water off the Pacific gets cold and deep quick and that's what, uh, that's what seabirds love. So we do go on a scheduled uh, a pelagic trip in Oaxaca. It's not, uh, it's in our own boat, so we don't have to share it with anybody else. Uh, it's a small vessel, it's a few hours, and um, 
also in Baja, there's opportunities for projects to see the Merlites and a variety of other stuff. And uh, two, two comments. What is a coaster? Transportation. A coaster. Oh, that's a that's a <laughs> that's a good a good question. A coaster is um, we call them coasters. It's it's a big uh, van. It's like a, a mini yeah, van. it's like a transport van, like one of those uh, where you can fit ten to twelve people, um, like a little bus van hybrid. Um, we don't ever fill it with you know we don't fill them up. So there's a lot of space for luggage and uh, other people there. Um, but yeah, it's just a comfortable mode. It's like a, a mixture between a van and a bus. Yeah. Um, Mike's asking, what is the species count for Mexico? Um, species count in total for the entire country is about 1,120, I think, um, more or less. On a trip, uh, we, we don't see all the birds or all the endemics. Um, so on a Oaxaca, or sorry, a Oaxaca and Veracruz, um, trip that we offer pretty frequently. You're looking at 350 to 370. Um, the Yucatan, you're looking at probably 200 to 250 birds. Um, it depends a lot. If you go in the winter, which our, our trips tend to, the northern winter, we get a lot of the migrants. That really pads the list, um, a lot of the migrants there. And uh, yeah, so if you combine Oaxaca, Veracruz, and Chiapas, you can get even more, so you can get into the 400s. Um, you can get well into the 400s there. Oh. But uh, yeah, quite a bird, a birdie, a birdie trip. Yeah. Um, thanks, James. Um, he, he also mentioned enthusiastic uh, presentation, and they're looking forward to their TaylorMade tour that's taking place next April. So we can't wait nice. for you to that's come awesome. with us. So thank you for joining us as well. Um, Lev, do you speak Spanish? I do. I do, yeah. So it's uh, it's quite useful uh, for me when uh, when I'm down there, uh, just to organize stuff. But yeah, I learned uh, I learned Spanish on my own in Costa Rica when I was volunteering, um, and it uh, yeah, it was it's very helpful. I I encourage uh, folks uh, to learn a few words of Spanish or whatever, or whatever language happens to be uh, spoken in the country that you're visiting on tour because it does uh, it does enhance your experience quite a bit. I think. Do you see any mammals as well on the on the tours? That's a good question. Um, mammals, there, there aren't a huge diversity of uh, a large mammals in Mexico. In Chiapas, there's the classic uh, big cats and uh, jaguar and puma and, and places like that throughout the country, uh, but they're hard to see. Um, the most mammals I would say that we see is when we do the pelagics. So there you could see uh, spinner dolphins, you can see Rizzo's dolphins sometimes, um, a variety of pinnipeds, sea lions, and uh, and what have you, fur seals sometimes. And uh, yeah, quite quite nice for mammals on the pelagics. But excuse me, on the mainland uh, we don't we don't tend to see a huge mammal diversity. Excuse me. Elise is asking me, uh, do you go to? And I'm probably going to pronounce this incorrectly. Is it Palen Palenque? Palenque, yeah, Palenque. Palenque. We uh, we do not go to Palenque um, right now. It uh, well, I don't know if we've ever gone there, but uh, yeah. So Palenque is a nice uh, a nice spot to visit. Certainly beautiful uh, beautiful ruins, and the birding around there uh, is quite good uh, as well. It's not somewhere that uh, contains something that we're not able to find in other places in the country uh, on the tour. Uh, it's a little bit out of the way. There's sort of a, a road that you have to traverse for quite a while to get there. Um, so at this point, no, unfortunately we don't go to Palenque, but again, it's one of these places that are very easily um, added on to a tailor-made tour or a pre or post expedition. Any, any recent records of uh, Cos Cosmola Thrasher last recorded oh, 10 yes. years ago? Ah, the Thrasher, yes. Yeah. So the other uh, species that I mentioned in Cosmola is the Thrasher. Um, and there is an endemic species of thrasher there. To my knowledge, it has not been seen uh, for a number of years. It's probably, uh, it's probably extinct, unfortunately. Um, there's not been any recent sightings that, uh, that I'm aware of. Uh, I'd love to be wrong, and I'd love for there to be a corner of the island where um, these thrashers are, uh, are still hanging on. The, the reason, they became very uncommon after uh, a major hurricane passed through, and... Um, 
since then, there's been other hurricanes that have sort of battered uh, Cozumel. It's a bird, um, if it's a bird that's adapted to living on islands, like a lot of birds are, uh, they probably, that probably isn't a huge factor in, in their extinction. So nobody really knows exactly why. Uh, it's probably habitat destruction and uh, a combination of other things. Uh, but they really um, became uncommon after that hurricane. That probably uh, mowed a lot of the population down, unfortunately. Um, a thank you to to Wendy that just mentioned. Um, you know, a big thank you for putting um, uh, putting this video on during the pandemic. Uh, I felt as if I've left my house. I'm I'm really grateful for that. Thank you, Wendy. Um, Great. Thank I you. I think I'm getting to the end of my questions now. So probably the last two. Uh, do you ever go to San Cristobal? Um, what birds would San, you find there? San, yeah, so um, I'm assuming it's the San Cristobal de las Casas, which is located in Chiapas, and we do go there. Uh, it's, uh, it's a beautiful uh, little town, uh, very colonial. It's got some, uh, some amazing architecture, and uh, it's got some nice pine forest around, and uh, we, do, we do visit it. We find uh, quite a few endemics uh, in in and around uh, San Cristobal. One of them is uh, pink-headed warblers around there. Uh, we look for it, uh, I think, now in another spot in Chiapas. But uh, yeah, so things like blue-throated mot mot and uh, a variety of others are, are around San Cristobal. And of course, you have time in the evening um, to, to go and explore. If, uh, yeah, I suggest going there. If you're interested uh, in, um, in culture and stuff like that at all, I suggest going there for a few days just to, just to soak that in. But yes, it is on our Chiapas itinerary. Great. And, and last question then. Um, we, we, we see you off a lot of different Mexico trips. Um, as a first timer to the country, which trip um, or which two would you recommend? Oh, that's a very good question. And a hard one for me just because there's so many different birds and so many different habitats in Mexico uh, that have a, a variety of different amazing uh, highlights when you visit. But um, I think for a first timer, I would say uh, Oaxaca. I think Oaxaca and, um, and Chiapas, or if you want to combine it with Veracruz, uh, either one of those two options is great for the first time. It's not overwhelming. There's not, you know, hundreds and hundreds of birds that, uh, that are completely new. Uh, it's very easy to grasp. The birds are quite, uh, quite punctual. Uh, there's not a lot of birds that we miss at all. Um, and there's enough sort of endemics to be you know, interesting for those folks who like endemics, but also a lot of uh, birds that are more typical of the south. So a lot of new birds to sort of pad the list. And in addition to that, there's also a lot of uh, wintering uh, boreal migrants as well. So you get sort of a, a nice blast of, uh, of what it's like to, to bird there. And um, yeah, the food is fantastic in Oaxaca. Uh, the architecture and the, uh, the history is also fantastic. And it's just a very pleasant, uh, a very pleasant trip. Oh, great. Thank you so much, Lev. That was amazing. Thank mm. you for taking us to Mexico. Thank you, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> But, it, uh, it really was, okay. yeah, Lev, absolutely. Very, very special. I mean, a part of the world that I know very little about, um, unfortunately, but wow, that was, that was eye-opening. And I mean, I agree with everyone who just had the flood of messages, but everyone's just loving your enthusiasm, your clear love for, <laughs> not, I guess, not just the country, but uh, for, for birding and wildlife and yeah. nature it's, and everything. Uh, it, it is my, just, you can just yeah. see it. It's, <laughs> And it's, it's and my it's whole world. Uh, this, is, this is what I live for. Uh, it's what I live to do. I'm thankful every day that I get to work with such an amazing crew at Rock Jumper and visit these amazing spots and, and the opportunity to share even when, uh, you know, I'm locked up here in, in a basement um, about all these amazing birds so that uh, hopefully one day when it's safe to, to emerge, uh, we, we, can all, uh, we can all do that and explore Mexico and uh, other yeah. places. Absolutely, absolutely. But yeah, very, very special indeed. Thanks, thanks so much, Lev. Thank you. Um, yeah, and, and thank you, Nikki, as well. Um, yeah, some lovely questions coming through as well. And uh, yeah, just a very enjoyable presentation. Thanks, guys. Um, so yeah, dream, uh, well, let's put it this way. Next week, uh, we are heading down to South America, uh, which hasn't actually been featured much so far in our Dream Destination series. So we're spending a little time in the Americas now. Uh, Mexico followed by, by a little time in South America and we are featuring 
Peru. So we're going to northern Peru. Uh, Rob Williams is going to be uh, treating us to, to a presentation uh, that he's going to be putting together for us or has put together for us. Um, and yeah, he'll be presenting that one next week. Uh, so yeah, we're going to be in a real treat um, because Rob knows Peru like nobody else really. Uh, he's got a massive passion for the country and the region and South America really as a whole. Um, but yeah, I think he's going to be uh, fantastic when it comes to showcasing uh, Peru and especially northern Peru. So yeah, I mean, it's the country with the second highest bird list in the world, over 1,800 species. Um, pretty much just a, a birding mecca. So, yeah, join us Join us next week for that one. Um, we're going to see a lot of very special images and, and talk about a lot of very special birds. It's the home of marvellous spatula tail, uh, long-whiskered owlet, yellow scarf tanager, and a whole bunch of others, royal sun angels and white-winged guans. So it, it should be a ton of fun. So please do join us uh, for that one next week. We'd love to, love to have you uh, there. Um, yeah, listening live with us. Uh, just a reminder again that these webinars are recorded and can be viewed later. Um, and those links will be available within the next 24 to 48 hours. And just another reminder as well that the webinars are being offered free of charge. Uh, but if you would like to donate towards our tour leaders, our GoFundMe link is still open. And 100% of the proceeds go directly to our guides. Um, yeah, you guys have been very generous very, very generous, and we thank you so much um, for all your contributions to date. And um, yeah, thank you again to everyone for joining us today. Uh, we really look forward to seeing you again next week, Wednesday, at the same time. So yeah, until then, um, goodbye from Team Rock Jumper. Cheers, everybody. Bye. Thanks again.